webinar by Wild Poland, so the Polish uh, affiliate of the World Institute for Action Learning. And I just want to introduce uh, to you, all of you our amazing guest today. I met Peter some time ago, I guess it was in Washington, where we both uh, came to Wild Conference. So Peter is, was born in Belgium, but right now works in Asia, mainly in Thailand. Uh, he's a facilitator, a trainer, a master action learning coach, a current board member of the World Institute for Action Learning and the founder of Asia Consulting and also, I guess, the founder of uh, the brand called Team as One. Is that correct, Peter? That's correct, yes. Okay, uh, so welcome, Peter. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me. Um, so we're going to spend uh, an hour all together. Are you good, Tom, for me to go? Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, uh, before, actually, before we move on, let me just make sure everybody knows this. So if anybody gets disconnected for any reason, remember you can use your local number and that local number should be in your email, that you, the confirmation email that you got after registering. And if not, uh, if you click that, um, that link, you should probably the, find somewhere that local number um, and if you use that, you can also listen to the webinar via phone. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is Peter is going to uh, tell us something about how to develop high-performance teams. And, I'm, and I'll be very curious about your experiences that as well, Peter, not only, uh, you know, the information, all the knowledge and all the research you can give us, because I know you wrote your PhD thesis on uh, how certain team aspects can be developed. But I'll be very curious about your experience. So what we're going to do is Peter will... Uh, use the presentation to tell us a few words about it, and then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have any questions on the way, I suggest you save them for the Q&A session at the very end. Okay, Peter, over to you. Okay, thank you, Tom, and again, uh, thank you for joining everybody. Yes, so the session is uh, developing high-performance teams. That's basically what I am focusing on now for the last six years or so. And in this session, there's going to be a bit of theory, a bit of practical information, and also uh, takeaways for you to see how I use the tools that I'm going to talk about uh, to develop high-performance teams. And of course, we're going to talk about action learning, uh, because just like Tom, I am I'm working for uh, WIAL Thailand. All right. So dive right in. So the title of my presentation is what Google found out about high-performance teams and how this can benefit you. Now, the fact that you sign up for the session means you see value or are interested in teams. And if you look at the statistics out there, um, two things. First of all, organizations expect their teams to perform. A lot of organizations say, if only my teams, my departments, my divisions could better work together, we would really create a better competitive advantage, innovative advantage, whatever. At the same time, the, the employees themselves say that they spend between a third to half of their time actually working with other people, working with teams. So for sure, there is a lot of people there either working in teams or saying we need to use our teams better. People who are not very known for their, let me call it, soft skills, right? Stephen Jobs uh, was a little, is still seen by many people as sole creative person behind Apple, but he himself said that uh, it's really teams that make things happen at Apple. Although he was the face and the voice, uh, it's the way people work together that helped Apple to come up with these great products. And so, People are convinced about the importance of teams. People work in teams all the time. Yet, at least in my experience, organizations spend most of their time and effort not on team development, but on leadership development or individual development. In fact, I to help a team work better together. Most of what we do is focused on the individual. And when we talk about teams, it's about how an individual can be a better team leader, how an individual can better develop a team. And when it comes to actually team development, most often this is what we end up with. We do the annual team building exercise. Great fun. Um, great for memories and pictures and, and laughter. But 
this is a rhetorical question, so don't need to answer. The day after the great team building on the beach, does a team really work better together? Um, I kind of doubt it. So, so yes, too often we associate team building with these kind of one-off or once a year events. If teams are really that critical, important for organizations, if, team, if people work in teams all the time, there should be something better than just doing some annual fun activity. I also want to emphasize that when we talk about teams and high performance teams, it's not about being friends. It's not about everybody liking each other and going out to the pub for a, a drink after the day's work. High performance team, the word in there is performance. So it's about making better decisions, uh, dealing better with issues, uh, developing themselves and others in the organization, performing and developing innovation, whether it's in products or services. So, so that's what a high performance team is about. It's not just people who like to or who get along well. If they do that, that's great, but that's definitely not a requirement. And so maybe it's because the best thing we've come up with is the annual team building exercise. The reality is that in the surveys done by a company called Team Coaching International, only 10% or less than 10% of teams in organizations rate themselves as high performance teams. So the good news is this: a lot of room for improvement. So Tom, you remember yes, we talked right. about yeah, yeah, I remember that. I have a question about this right now. Um, so there are a lot of resources that tell people how to build high-performance teams and what a high-performing team is. So does that mean all these resources are wrong or inaccurate? There is indeed a lot of resources. If you, uh, if you look up high-performance teams, you will come up with uh, blogs and consultants and books who all Thing they have found the holy grail who all think that you know if you only do that then you have a high performance team and this is kind of a snapshot what you will come up with and this list is not complete right they will say yeah but you know you must have a shared purpose that's the key thing if you only have a shared purpose then all the rest happens or you should have a diverse team diversity is great etc etc so all these sources claim that what they think is the real important thing is the only one that counts so the interesting thing is when a company like Google wanted to find out themselves what really makes the difference between an average team and a high performance team, they, um, they didn't look up, they didn't Google for the answer as we sometimes do. They actually looked at their own internal teams and they analyzed in a pretty rigorous way, in a research way, semi-academic way, I would say. Uh, they researched their own teams. They looked why are some teams always forming better, why are some teams always struggling? So they analyzed 180 teams. It's a, it was a three-year project started in 2012, and they called it Project Aristotle. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher who said, the whole is larger than the sum of its parts, kind of to use that as a symbol of a high-performance team, right? Why do some teams seem to perform better than the individuals that are in that team? So they ran that project internally, analyzing 180 teams, doing both quantitative and qualitative studies, interviewing people, trying to look at teams' performances. And, and Google is good at looking at data and looking at patterns. And so they were looking for patterns. And they were looking for patterns that would pop up from their analysis that would say that some combinations of kinds of people uh, make for a better team. For example, you put a lot of introverts together, you know, whatever, a great team, or you put 50-50, uh, you would have a, an even greater team. So they were looking for mix of personalities. And that's actually very often when we look at, when you look at a team. Uh, I have there just in the background uh, the MBTI profiles. But if you look at many profiles, we look at individuals. And then we say, if you put those personalities together, they do well or they do not so well. So one of the first conclusions they came up with is that the who part of the team didn't seem to matter. So you can have all bright people or all average people or all not so average people. Whatever way you cut or paste it, whatever way you combine it, that is not what makes the difference. And so what they came up with, what they started to see was team norms. So not who's on the team, but more how does this team work? And so they've kind of were a bit surprised about that. And they kind of went back to the, 
research because they were they had been looking for different patterns based on different concepts and, and not the one about team norms. And when they looked back at the research, they came across a concept they had not heard about yet until that time. And that concept was is team psychological safety. And the more they studied that concept, the more they started to say that yes, that is really what their research showed is that this this thing, this idea called team psychological safety is really what makes the difference. So important to mention here is it, it, I, they did not say that diversity is bad, for example, just to pick one, but they did find that you can have diverse teams that are doing extremely well, but you can also have completely homogeneous teams that are doing very well. And just the opposite, you can have diverse teams that don't do well at all or, that, or homogeneous teams that don't do well at all. So all these other characteristics that we like to put on high performance teams, they were not significant. So what was really significant was this concept of high of team psychological safety. And these are actually the results that Google published. They, they made their research public um, in their on their blog, they call it a blog uh, called read, read column work. Uh, and they have a, a ton of information on there also uh, besides this, this team psychological safety. So here are the actual results they published. Uh, in the end of 2015, beginning 2016. And so they said there's really five elements that make the difference between a high performance team and a so so team. And they're here one, two, three, four, five. And so you see two, three, four, five dependability, structure and clarity, meaning, impact. You can read them. Um, and these are also elements that impact team performance. However, the one at the top is in a different color because they found that by far, actually four times more, the impact of the top one is four times more important than the impact of number two, three, four, or five. So that's how they published their result to say the real difference between high performance team and so-so teams is team psychological safety. So Peter, I have a question on this one as well. So it looks like- and So of course, when Google found that- yes. Sorry, Peter, can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay, like sorry. I think there's a little delay on the line. So anyway, uh, Peter, uh, my, my understanding is that team psychological team psychological safety seems to be a really crucial element here, and it's it's it sounds from what you're saying, it sounds like Google at the beginning didn't realize that, and then they they uh, sort of discovered it, or um, they came to this conclusion after some time and they didn't take this into account at the beginning. So my question is, is this term team psychological safety or psychological safety sort of new? Was it discovered or created by Google or was it known a long time ago and they and then they just didn't know about it? How, so what, what about yeah. this term uh, psychological safety? Tell me more about it. Yeah. So now, at, when Google published their results, um, so and put the word psychological safety, let's say, out there, then all of a sudden everybody got excited about that. Uh, until then, you would look for psychological safety or team psychological safety. You would f find very few concrete or let's say uh, empirical data about it. But once Google started to talk about it, then all of a sudden everybody looked at that and it was as if Google had discovered something new. But as I just mentioned before, Tom, and you alluded to, no, it was not something new. The concept team psychological safety was actually coined or created for the first time uh, 20 years ago, 20 years ago uh, next year by a professor called Amy Edmondson from Harvard University. And she uh, identified and, and in a very, another reason that for 20 years it's, it well, didn't come to them to the public is that it was a very academic concept, uh, has been studied by many, many researchers. And as you mentioned in the beginning, I did my PhD at it, my PhD partly based on team psychological safety. So many academics have studied it and come with very interesting conclusions, but it never really connected with, let's say, mainstream um, HR or OD uh, sources. So this is what Amy Edmondson identified as team psychological safety in 1999, a shared understanding by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. So that's a little, a little bit of a long sentence, but, but that is, and it's important, I think, to go back to that original definition, because what I have to say is that all the people who started to read about, uh, write about 
Team Psychological Safety since 2015, uh, kind of take a little bit of shortcuts, but I, and uh, that's what I want to do in the rest of this presentation, um, to really go back to the origins of the concept and see what Amy Edmondson came up with. So, moving so Peter, on. Before, yes, go ahead, before Tom. you go on, a quick question here. Do you know if, if she worked with Google in their research? Did they use their, uh, sorry, did they use her knowledge in any way? Or, or was it just her research that they, that they used? I think it was just her research. Now, now since, since the results, they kind of, they kind of uh, talk the same language. Uh, Edmondson herself uh, did say that she was very excited to, to, to see Google's findings, but it was not a, a, Google did not sponsor, you know, an external academic. They actually used internal resources. And I think these resources, as far as I know, came across this concept then built on it, and, and only once the research the, resor the research was finished, then Edmondson also now kind of connects. So it was, um, was a very, when I said, I actually said Google did it semi-academically. Um, I think the pure academics would disagree with that. Um, so, so Edmondson was really at the academic side. Okay. All right. So the key word here is interpersonal risk-taking, and I would like to invite the audience to get ready because I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to to share your thoughts the, the key word here is interpersonal risk taking so it's what does that mean It's taking risks with other people now a risk is something that is an action you take is something you do of which you don't know what will have what result will be you can get a positive result a gain now if it would be a financial one that's that's a, a financial gain but when it comes to interpersonal risks uh, a gain following an interpersonal risks means what? Or a loss from an interpersonal risks means what? Well, it could be that people appreciate you. People say, hey, that's a great idea. I didn't think about that. Uh, cool, let's, let's continue with that. But it could be the opposite. If you come up with a new idea, people will go behind your back and say, where did he get that? You know, well, doesn't he know that? I don't know, we don't do stuff like that around here. So interpersonal risks is people things people do or say of which they don't know for sure how other people in the team will react. They can react in a positive way. That would mean, of course, positive team psychological safety where they receive appreciation. They could, re they could react in a negative way where the person who actually spoke up would feel threatened. So this is a key part um, to understand because too often people go a little bit lightly on it. And here I would like to take a few minutes to ask people in the audience to look at your chat box. And so the question I'm asking, what would be behaviors that constitute interpersonal risk-taking in a team? What would people do? Now, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit strict on the word behavior. A behavior is something people can say or do, right? Uh, to have an open mind is not a behavior. Uh, but what could be behaviors that people take, act out, say out in a team that constitutes an interpersonal risk of which they are not sure that this behavior would be seen positive by the team or seen negative. So I'm going to stop talking for two minutes and I'll see what comes in the chat box. Yeah, make sure uh, you, you write your answers in the chat box and if somebody uh, doesn't feel um, certain enough to write things in English, feel free to do it in Polish and I will just translate these things to Peter. So, so again, the question is what behaviors can be actually uh, interpersonal risk-taking? I'm going to say that in Polish, so, so I make sure everybody understands. Then, słuchaj, jak gdybym miał powiedzieć to po polsku, to Peter pyta o to, jakie zachowania tak naprawdę mogą mogą być tym podejmowaniem ryzyka w interpersonalnym kontekście, w interpersonalnym sensie. Jakie zachowania mogą być ryzykowne interpersonalnie w zespole? Somebody has just written, have a strong opinion towards the topic. So I guess, I guess the behavior... I'm going to wait for a few minutes and I'll, I'll, I'll react to that. All right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to see a few more. So. Think about, um, think about when you see people work together, what, uh, what would be behaviors that people can take that constitute a risk? So thank you. I see a few coming in.
So I see a few more people typing. I'll, I'll wait uh, 10 more seconds. Oh, so there's a few interesting ones there. They're all interesting. I'm not going to go through all of them. I apologize. Um, so somebody said that was the first person, so I do need to uh, look at that. Um, having having a strong opinion about something. So I want to I want to I want to fine tune that a little bit. It's speaking up about a strong opinion I have about a topic. Yes, that can be if the group moves to a certain decision and I have a strong opinion about another one. If I kind of defend my position, that can be taking a risk. Very good one. So the team can say can can say yes, you're right. You know, maybe we have to revise our our thoughts. Uh, or they can say, you know, stop talking about this. We we we're moving into another direction. So so that's exactly what we're looking for. And now I see a lot of a lot coming in all of a sudden. So I'm gonna having a different opinion and speaking up about it. Um, so personally accusing. Now now this, for example, um, I wanna I wanna highlight. If I accuse somebody, um, that's a bit of a strong and I would say negative word maybe because um, I'm not sure if I accuse Tom who's sitting there then that 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 there is a way to get a positive out a positive consequence of that I think it's a little bit as the action itself it's it's maybe a little bit negative um, pointing fingers I need to, I need to um, clarify that Peter so so when you when you talk about interpersonal risk taking and the behaviors connected with that, we understand that the outcome may be negative or positive, right? So we can easily expect positive outcome, but the negative outcome may uh, may also be there. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And that's going to be the difference between a team with high team psychological safety and low team psychological safety. In some team, when I defend my position, um, everybody may may be may be gossiping behind my back, may be laughing at me. In another team, defending my position will be seen as okay. He's really convinced about this point of view. We have to revise our strategy to take that into account. Exactly. Now, I, somebody, I have a. There's a lot of things in this chat box now. I kind of underestimated uh, being able to talk and read and talk at the same time. I, actually, I like what somebody said. It could be almost everything from bringing new ideas to being strict in performing in a certain way, comply some rules, etc. Typical battle between, and then uh, I, I don't say everything. It, it, I, don't, I don't say it's, it can be everything, but yes, speaking up, um, sharing your ideas, asking questions, challenging, it can be everything. It can be a lot of things. Let me put it that way. Here is my list. So it's I'm going to give you a few minutes to look. Peter, um, would you would you say would you say it would be something similar to Peter uh, to what uh, sorry Patrick Lencioni writes in his um, five dysfunctions of a team? I think his fifth, um, his um, first dysfunction is lack of trust, which really yes. boils down to people being vulnerable and then being judged or criticized or stuff like that. So. So, so, so these behaviors sounds—they sound like vulnerability, like like being vulnerable to people in the team. Would, would that be accurate? I think there are some of them. Um, for me, not all of them are showing vulnerability. Uh, if I say asking probing questions, I see it somewhere in the middle of the slide. They're asking probing questions. Is that showing vulnerability? Not necessarily. Somebody who wrote in the chat box, you know, defending my position. If I'm very convinced about something. So vulnerability is a part of it, but I don't think this equals vulnerability. And again, the challenge is, as it's it's written, interpersonal risk taking. Um, it depends on the others. <laughs> That's exactly what this is about. Um, these actions in one team can be accepted, can be the norm, can be how people want to work. And in, in a different team, can be the exact opposite. Okay. So I get. Um, thank you all for. Um, uh, Contributing and and yes, somebody said um, uh, if if you do this, I'll tell the boss. A very good point because what's important here is and some sometimes people confuse that this is about interactions between the members of the team. This is not between each team member and the boss. This is what's happening between the team members. Now, of course, the boss is a part of the team, but uh, it's not just vis-a-vis -vis the boss. And that's quite often uh, a simplification I hear people make. It's it's as if the the team is what the boss decides it to be, all right? 
So this is a list. This is not the complete list. And thank you all for your input. Um, so you, you, you get what interpersonal risk take. But again, a very good point. I do want to repeat it, Tom. Um, it's behaviors of which, in some cases, you can have a positive outcome. And in some cases, you can have a negative outcome. OK? So somebody wrote, I, I saw there earlier, shouting. I'm not sure if that's the kind of behavior that's in many teams would be seen as, as something positive and OK, let's please keep shouting and let's you know, all shout together. So, so it's, it's things that you could expect both kinds of results from the people around you. All right, I'm going to move on. What's interesting is when Edmondson came up with this 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, uh, neuroscience was not very advanced yet. But neuroscience is uh, very interesting and, and actually confirms everything we're, lear we're learning about team psychological safety. So our brain has become very smart at identifying physical threats. Uh, we, do not think, we, we do not need to think very hard if we're confronted with the image on the left. We know what we do. Our brain insti instinctively, but actually it's an immediate reaction of you know, fleeing or, or whatever. Uh, and, and somebody, Paul McLean, visualized that or, or, or represented that with what he called the triune brain, uh, with these three types of brains, reptile, mammal, human brain. I mean, we all have all three zones, of course. They also correspond to physical zones in the brain that get activated uh, depending on what's happening. So if I am confronted with the lion in the previous slide, then my reptile brain, my survival brain, will be the one activated and, and my other brains will be devoid of any activity because I'm focusing on survival. So I'm not going to be good at solving problems or being creative if I'm being threatened. And so uh, neuroscience and actually brain scans have demonstrated that we, we see exactly the same thing, not with physical threats, but with social threats, working with people where you feel threatened where you feel that the behaviors we just mentioned will have a negative impact, has the same impact on our brain. Uh, it's as if our reptile brain is functioning and our reptile brain is looking for survival. And so coming up with great ideas or looking for better performance or collaborating better with others will not work if all the focus of my brain is on survival. So that's just a side note because we could go much more in detail about neuroscience, but Everything that Edmondson this kind of developed uh, 20 years ago has now also been confirmed by uh, neuroscience. We go back to Edmondson. So what we have said so far is that team psychological safety is what made the difference between, with, with, with high perf team performance. And that's what Google in its, in its more, more or less empirical research confirmed. But the picture is not complete because actually that's something that people don't talk about too much. What Edmondson really said was the following, is that team psychological safety is a key element for team learning, which then ultimately leads to team performance. So it's not as if these behaviors in of themselves impact team performance. These behaviors allow a team to learn, learn from what goes well, learn from what goes not so well. And it's this team learning concept that is really the driver for team performance. And she, Edmondson, um, demonstrated that or, or validated her research uh, with uh, surgical teams, cardiac, cardiac surgery teams, um, who had to use a new procedure uh, to do cardiac uh, surgery interventions. And she studied several teams uh, in, the, in the hospitals in the US. And so you have to imagine an operating room uh, team where you have the senior surgeon, senior heart surgeon, uh, you have the anesthetist, you have nurses, you have people helping. So there's a lot of hierarchy in that team. And the teams where people were comfortable to speak up, the teams where there was a high level of team psychological safety, very interesting, actually made more mistakes because they reported more mistakes. They e more easily talked about mistakes. When the doctor did something, he was he didn't have a problem to ask to the people around him, hey, uh, what was the next step? Or uh, what are we supposed to do now? Doing that, the team was capable of learning faster and getting a better performance. And so she demonstrated that these teams uh, that a higher level of team psychological safety got to a higher performance. In this case, it meant, of course, successful 
surgeries and quicker um, recovery faster than the other teams. In other teams where the nurse wouldn't speak up or where the doctor would not ask others what they thought about what was going on, teams with lower level of team psychological safety, think back again at those uh, risk teams. Those teams made apparently less mistakes because they, they hid them, they didn't talk about them, uh, but their performance lacked also uh, compared to the other teams. So this is the research uh, Edmondson did initially, and as I said earlier, has been replicated many times in very academic settings, and really for the first time by Google in a more, let's say, pragmatic setting. So Peter, I have a question here on this one. Um, so going one step further. a lot about yes. uh, team psychological safety. So let's say I'm a coach, I'm a facilitator. How can I practically use this knowledge? If I know there is something like this, team psychological safety, I come to the organization, I do team coaching. How can I use this in practice? Exactly. Uh, and that is both what I'm excited about and, and allow me to say a bit frustrated about because what you found out there, if you look for team psychological safety, is a lot of people giving tips and best practices and good advice. Um, I think there is a bit more to it, and that's what I will share now in the next uh, minutes. Uh, in fact, in Edmondson's original research, there were seven elements that really constitute team psychological safety, and they're shown here. Uh, how does the team deal with issues? How do they accept diversity? Not how diverse are they? It's how do they accept diversity in the team? Uh, how do they take risks? Not interpersonal ones, but this is now about business risk or whatever the work scope is. How do they support one another? How do they ask for help? How do they appreciate one another and how do they react to mistakes? And so these, I call them the elements, the seven elements are actually measured in the research that Edmondson has done and, and the work I have done, we actually measure team psychological safety. So we have these seven statements. I'm not going to read all of them. Each statement, let's say, is it asks people to see how, the, how this particular element is dealt with, is living in the team. All right. So let me pick one asking for help. It's easy to ask other members, other members of this team for help. So what we do when we measure team psychological safety, we're going to ask the members of the team anonymously to rate these seven, there are seven elements. And we do that with a very typical scale from strongly disagree to, do do, to strongly agree from the left to the right. And so people will tick, just tick anonymously and we collect the results. And you can do that on a paper, uh, you can do it online. And actually, uh, I want to make sure I don't forget, Tom, we will share with the participants form, actually. It's something you can easily use. Uh, you print it out. You ask people to anonymously. That's, of course, important um, to, for the, to anonymously answer. And, and you get the data. Of course, you need to do something with the data. You, de you get the raw data of, your, uh, of how the team rates these several statements. OK? So we move on, because once I... Uh Yes, go ahead. So a quick question, uh, Peter. Do you know Charles Duhigg and his book, uh, Better, Faster, Smarter, or something like that, or Faster, Smarter, Better? Have you heard about it? I heard about it, but not much more than that. Yeah, it's the same author that wrote uh, The Power of Habit. So he writes about this research as well. And as far as I remember uh, the content of that chapter, he writes that Google found that basically two behaviors um, uh, related to team psychological safety in Google, which was um, the equal time yeah. for everybody to speak up during the meeting and also sort of equal emotional yeah. sensitivity to each other, like recognizing that somebody's angry or exactly. disappointed and stuff like that. How does this relate to these yes. elements that you just mentioned? Uh, so I didn't mention it, and it's right, Tom, when Google uh, published their results, they mentioned those two um, characteristics of their teams. Um, I, I could have mentioned it. They relate. Uh, I, I wanted to go back to the original work that's been done by Edmondson. And I, I, so if your question is, do those, sorry, do those two correspond to one of the seven? No, no. That's how Google shared their findings. Um, you could you could probably analyze which of the seven they you know came up with. So so I haven't touched upon that because I wanted to. What what very few people do is to actually go back to the original research of 
Edmund. So uh, it's, I would say it's the Google's findings captured in those two indeed um, behaviors that they saw in those teams. Do you, do you think it would be cool to add these two to the seven? What do you think? No, I don't think it would not be cool uh, because uh, all the research has been done around <laughs> all, well, you asked me the question, so I'll answer you, right? So all the research has been done around these seven statements and there's been, frankly, uh, tons of research that nobody nobody knows about because it all happened before Google talked about it. And, and for me, that is the real, the real essence. Um, so, so no, it's, it's a good point why Google, uh, I don't think they actually use this instrument. They use their own internal assessments or surveys and, and then they kind of highlighted those two elements you mentioned. But my, the way I work, I always go back to the original work of Edmondson. But good question. You are you co you come prepared. Excellent. So I go back to how I work with this because your question was Tom. You know how do we how do we work with this? Uh, and again, if I go back to what Google just what you just shared, okay, uh, equal airtime. That's one of the things they said. Now I personally doubt that if I put a rule in place that from now on we will have equal airtime, that all of a sudden that will work. I think concepts like team psychological safety and taking these under interpersonal risk, I, I think they go a little bit deeper. And so I work with the, I would say a little bit, the original uh, elements um, uh, Edmondson came up with. So I then look at the data that I have collected anonymously. And I look, for example, how people answer the question about uh, reaction to mistakes. If you make a mistake on this team, it's not really helped against you. And we will just plot, this is basic, you know, nothing advanced here. We will just plot how people answer. This is a real team with real answers. So, Apparently, maybe one person said, uh, I disagree somewhat, and then uh, maybe four, four or five said, uh, I'm, I'm un actually undecided. I have to correct that. It's not undecided. It's more neither agree nor disagree. Uh, it then some a bit more said agree somewhat, and some people said agreed. So this is how this team answered the general state, or rated the statement. If you make a mistake on this team, it's not really hand against you. But it gets interesting. So the average of these numbers, if you add, you know, if you make the average, uh, Strongly disagree is one and strongly agree is seven. You make the average 4.7. What it gets interesting is if you look at those images here, and um, I'm going to ask again people to get at their keyboard. Um, those two images are answers of different teams, of course, uh, answering the same question. And both have the same average. And if you don't believe me, you, you can check it out later. But the, the, the average is exactly 4.7 in both cases. But what is different? How would you describe with your own words what is different between the left and the right hand side? So whoever uh, feels that they have a, 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 a they, they know how to put in words what is different, how would you um, verbalize that or type it out? I'll see who I'll see where the first answer comes. Many are typing. So uh, team one is cohesive in their opinion. Team two isn't at all, left and right, right? Average is the same, the answers are completely different, diversified, yes. Um, so the, on the left, people have a more similar answer to the question. And on the right, people have a very different answer to the question. But now it gets more interesting. Which one is best? And here I always get a diverse answer that makes it interesting. So just put left or right in the text box. Which one do you think is better? No, it does not depend for me, so I don't accept that as the answer. So far I have only have votes for the left. Depends on your goal. Okay, so right is better. Okay, okay. So um, I, I um, thank you for for answering uh, and taking the interpersonal risk of um, of picking one or the other. Uh, my answer will be, um, and if you if you don't agree, we can take it offline because I don't think we'll have time online. But so first of all, how do we represent that? We represent it with a mathematical term called spread or deviation, standard deviation. Uh, and uh, while average, we could all agree, I think, uh, the higher the better. 
or spread or standard deviation, the lower the better. So if you're not used with the numbers, it's a bit counterintuitive, but the lower the better. On the left, it's 0 0.87, the right, it's 1.51. Now, why is the left better? It does not depend on the goal, because you remember the statement of team psychological safety. It's a shared belief by people in the team. And if you look at the left-hand side, you can say that more or less the people in that team have a shared belief, a shared understanding of that particular issue around reaction to mistakes. It's kind of shared. They have a similar answer. On the right-hand side, people have a very different opinion of the same question, of the same statement. Somebody says, in this team, in this specific team that I work on, uh, I completely agree that if you make a mistake, it's not held against you. And people say the exact opposite. And we're talking about people working in the same team day in and day out. So there is no sharedness. There is no level of there's no shared understanding. And that's why, that's why what Edmondson said is that on the right-hand side, you have some people say, well, at least some people see it positively. But the real issue is you talk about interpersonal risks. So some people in this team say, I cannot take any risk. Uh, sorry, when I take make mistakes with others, it, it's a disaster, while others say exactly the opposite. And so that's why in working with teams, the left-hand side is, is a better starting point. It does not mean that in absolute terms it's better, but it's a better starting point. Because you can say clearly to the team, hey, here's how we all look at this, and it seems we're pretty much aligned. I give one more example of a bit the opposite. Um, uh, the, the result is very low. But again, on the left-hand side, the result is low, but people seem to agree that taking risks on this team is not safe. So it's easier to start a conversation and to start to work on how we can do something about it than on the right-hand side, where you know people say, taking a risk, my God, it's suicide. And other people think, my, taking a risk is the easiest thing around. So this, it's important to see that this is a team concept. It's not what Joe says versus what Susan said. It's really what how the team sees this concept or this 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 one of these seven elements. So when I have measured all that, I actually create a report where I show those results. There's an, I compare the results of a particular team with teams I have measured this before. And I have a pretty long report that I cannot go in detail now. I also am quite happy with this representation. I have to look at the seven elements of team psychological safety. And I look at a, I create a green zone, orange zone, and red zone. Basically, green zone is more with high average, low standard deviation. And the more you go to the red, of course, the lower the average and the higher the standard deviation. So two ways to look at this. We have some elements that we're doing pretty well. That's the ones in the green zone. Let's celebrate that. Let's continue to build on that. Let's talk about it. But we also have some elements that are closer to the red zone. And there maybe we need to have a discussion. I'm going to move on to the last part of my presentation. Tom, I need three more minutes because that's all nice. But what now? OK, we can we have talked about team psychological safety. We have a way to measure it. So what? In the end, it's all about making a difference. And of course, this is what I'm going to introduce action learning. It comes a bit at the end of my talk. But um, this is the definition we use in while of action learning. It's a problem solving process with a small group working on real problems, taking action and learning as individuals and as a team while doing so. And I've been working like Tom. I've been working with action learning for six years now. And when I studied in my PhD team psychological safety, and at the same time I had my experience with action learning, I kind of felt a good, a good connection. And I, I really was intrigued to explore more about that. If you look at the, while as an organization said so there are five key benefits of action learning, solving problems, leadership development, creating the learning organizations, we offer a coach certification program to help organizations make all this sustainable. And of course, the last one, that's the one I pointed out, that's high performance teams. So I've always been in wanting to measure that because it's one thing to say, well, action learning is good for teams, but, but can you actually measure the difference it makes? And uh, the answer is of yes. I'm going to share one example with you now. I actually have 10 10 companies, I 10 teams I did this with, and I'm just going to show one. So this is a leadership team, a bit, a bit of a, to be honest, a bit of a big group, 11 people. That was a bit too much, too many. But you see the, the makeup. And important in action learning, now this is very important. We did not bring the team together to say, we're all going to learn how to be a better team. We're all going to try to improve team psychological safety. In fact, we never mentioned team psychological safety. The team was brought together to solve this particular problem how to improve engagement in the plants. They had 
just finished a, um, a survey, annual survey, and the results were not so good. Uh, and so the, the leadership team, the management team, was asked by the MD, what can we do to improve engagement in the plant? And that's the topic the team worked on. And in the end, I'm not going to show you the result here, but they showed, of course, their action plan to the, to the, to the MD. That's what action learning is about, to identify what's the real problem, uh, to use questions, reflection, actions between sessions, etc., and an action plan to the boss, and the boss was pretty happy. But what I'm talking about here is not about the actual action plan. I'm talking about here about the team psychological safety. I measured team psychological safety in this team before we started to work. So that's the result on the left, average spread or standard deviation. Is this good, is this bad? I have no idea, but this is, the, this is how the team was. And then we worked, we had a one day team alignment session, then we had four action learning sessions over uh, four months. Again, after which the team presented to the boss their result. But at the same time, I measured team psychological safety at the end is all I found. So the average increased and the spread decreased. Now, some of you may say, oh, well, is that a lot? I don't know if that's a lot. It has gone in the right direction. Uh, I don't say that action learning is a miracle solution and solves everything overnight, but at least things go in the right direction. And uh, I, I invite you, uh, dear participants, to look out. Very few people, a lot of people talk and write about uh, team psychological safety. Very few people, I have to say, I haven't found anyone yet, actually measure it do something with the team and then measure it again to see the impact. And so I'm very uh, excited with, with this kind of result. I've done that now with 10 teams and each time I have an improvement uh, quite a lot in terms of reduction of the spread. It seems people seem much more aligned working together in these action learning sessions. They seem to be much more connected and have the same vision. And for me, the reason, and I represent it like this, uh, in action learning, on the short term, we work on the issue. The, the, in this case, it was about customer uh, employee engagement. Uh, we talk about people work talk about the work about their real job. Okay, but what happens, and I call this under the water line, is through asking questions, reflecting, giving feedback to one another, listening to one another. That's really where you build respect and trust and and openness and collaboration. So I always call that the short-term benefit of the action learning, which is the problem we need to solve, we need to work on a problem. But in the, at the same time, we build leadership, we build, long, uh, we build high performance teams, and ultimately we help the organization to learn. So in conclusion, um, team psychological safety is a key point when it comes to high performance teams. A lot of people write about it, very few people measure it. I have given you the tool to measure it. It's, you can use it freely as long as you mention Edmondson. Um, and then, and then, of course, ultimately, you have to do something with the tool and with the team and hopefully take some actions, work with the team and be able to come up with a better result of team psychological safety after uh, your intervention. And I want to share uh, the, the, the wise words of Reg Revens uh, to wrap up my explanations and I would be happy to take any questions that there are. Okay, so we have a Q&A session, so if anybody has any questions, please please feel free to type them into the chat box. And I will just say that if you are interested to find out more about the relationship between action learning and trust or psychological safety in the team, Forbes has actually written an article about it. And if you, if you go to Google and you just type in Forbes, um, this team has increased trust, um, action learning, questions, things like that, you will find the article. If anybody has problems, just email me and then I will, uh, I will send you an email. I actually talk about this article in the free online training that you can find on wildpoland.org. So if you go to wildpoland.org, you can see the free online training. The article uh, is mentioned there. So it's a really nice article about the relationship between one and the other. Um, Jonathan has the first question, I guess, to you, Peter. Can you have a look? Yes, I've seen the question. So can you provide participants with a full sample report of your team psychological safety assessment? I have a sample report, but I, I do not share all the pages. Uh, I, I think out of the 30 pages, I maybe maybe about 10 or 12 or something. Uh, and that I can share, but I do not share the entire report. Um, so, so I have a, I have a sample of, of a few pages, not more than a few, 10, 12 pages to give you a, 
a feeling or to give a client a feeling of what the report uh, ends up with. Okay, so so Alexandra asked a question. Did you think changing the scale in the research to cut the point in the middle, not agree or disagree point to avoid a center? Um, interesting point. Uh, so my, my short answer will be will be no, because um, I wanted to make sure that everything I did was I could link back to Edmondson research and, and the same was she used the same seven points, what we call Likert scale. I use the same in my academic research. Now, very surprised, well, not so, I'm not sure, Alexander, but maybe you're expecting that in many cases you will see a heavy tilt to the middle. And actually, that's not the case. Very interestingly, I never see, uh, actually, the, the example I showed is, is a, a bit atypical. Um, most of the time, you don't see a lot of people clicking or choosing the four, you know, the not agree nor, nor disagree. Uh, I was a bit concerned about that as well, but people seem to have a pretty uh, clear view of those seven statements. So I've never had that as a challenge. And again, uh, there's a lot of which are scales are better than others. Um, so that's my that's my answer to that. I always use the seven point scale. Thanks for the, thanks for the question, uh, Alexandra. I can't see any other questions, but if anybody has one, feel free to type them in. And remember, they can also be in Polish. They don't have to be in English. Feel free to do that in Polish. Take interpersonal risk, and I will translate them to you. Yeah, Jonathan. Well, is appearing th again, I guess. Th thank you, Jonathan. And, and allow me, it's not a question, but I will answer to it. Not seen before, yes. And that is my. Um, uh, at the same time, frustration and, and what I'm proud of, of what I'm doing, because a lot of people write about team psychological safety, but I have yet to come across somebody who measures it before, then then works with a team and then measures it often. And ultimately, it's what it's about, right? You can you can write lists with best practices and tips, but that's a bit uh, that's a bit easy. So thank you, Jonathan, for that um, for that feedback. Looks like Alexandra was typing something too. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan is asking about getting the sample report. Is that in any way possible, Peter? Yes, yes. I was going to ask back to you, uh, Thomas. Do you have the emails of people who signed up? Uh, because I, I don't, I don't have them. So I'm going to send that sample report, the partial sample report, to you, uh, Tom, and then, and then you can see who wants yeah. it. That's what we will do. I will email everybody from the list with a one pager um, with the tool that uh, Peter mentioned and I will attach also that report that Peter you will send me. Alexandra has uh, one more question. Alexandra has a very long question so that's why it took a while to come through. Uh, are there any suggestions of how many of those seven aspects should be on certain level to make a statement like yes this is a psychologically safe environment for me? That's a very good question, and it's the first time somebody answered, asked it, and I don't have a, a good answer. Um, so what I do, Alexandra, is measure those seven elements. I want to go back to this here for a minute. For example, what I did with this team, it, these are all the seven elements mixed together. Okay, I don't, I don't have the, we don't have the time here to go in detail. Uh, of course, there were sub elements that had different pictures, right? So, so but here in the, in the condensed image, um, I, I don't have, um, sorry, I have, I have only that, I put them all together. Now, I would say, and I don't, I don't, I know that sounds a bit weird, but it depends uh, because when you say psychological safe environment for me, um, well, who is me? Right in this team, there were 11 people. Uh, the answers you have on the left and the right is the answer of those 11 people. Still, even after, some overall give more positive answers than others. Some people still rate, rate quite low. Um, the, the idea of team psychological safety is really that's a team concept, and as long as somebody feels that this is not safe for me, and maybe some others in the team feel this is pretty safe for me, then, then we're still not there. It's really the idea that everybody in the team feels comfortable for that. So I don't have a better answer, Alexandra, than that. It's actually a good question. Uh, but, but I would say 
keep in mind that we call it a team concept. So to pick out one individual, to pick out these 11 individuals and then ask them at the end, so is this psychologically safe or not for you? Um, that That's something we, we don't really do because it's it's really all, all the analysis at the team level. Yes, well, Kalyani Kumar, in some cultures, alignment is conformism, basically doing what the others do. I need not always, it need not always mean true agreement. How do you, how do you come across challenges around this while administering this tool? Uh, I live, I know where you, I know where you are based, Kalyani, but uh, I am in uh, in Thailand, and uh, I recognize, of course, what you say. Uh, group think, it's it's not just, I mean, it exists in different cultures. Um, when, when, when you ask people to do the survey, I very clearly explain that it's anonymous. And it's really anonymous. I, I cannot find out who answered what, uh, whether I do it on paper or on online. So I really emphasize that it's, that it's anonymous. And I really ask them to answer to the best of their understanding of each of these aspects in the team. So people are not sitting next to each other and saying, you know, what are you answering? They're really doing it individually. That still doesn't mean that they answer what they really think. But that is indeed a problem with every assessment. You can only work with what people um, have, have shared. Um, another part of the answer is that the, the results, the report, is just a starting point. Uh, you know, it's not going to be like, oh, we have the report and now everybody's happy and we did a great job. It's a starting point to work with the team. And if I work with the team and I see down the road that there's things going on that were not so relevant from the report, I'm not going to say, hey, guys, but you said in the report this or that. I'm going to work with what I have at that moment. And so if there's this uh, lack of alignment or issues, I will work with that at that moment. Uh, but I do. I just try to emphasize that it's um, anonymous and people don't really have the time or the opportunity to you know, say, what should we be answering here? Thank you for the questions. So Peter, we still have one minute. Um, I'm very curious because you're running a Calc program very shortly uh, this weekend. You told me that right before the webinar, something we call in Poland the School of Action Learning. Um, do you see any change in your groups when you train people in action learning? Because I'm assuming they do a lot of sessions together as well. Do you see any of change course. in that as well? Of course, what, what, I was going to say 1,000% that, that that doesn't sound very really professional. Exactly. Uh, I have in all the calc programs I've done, you work with these people five or six days. And in the beginning, often they don't know each other. And then they're going to do these action learning sessions where somebody will be the coach, somebody will present a challenge they have. This team at the end of five or six days is a different team. They really you know, have learned about action learning, have become coaches or, or on the way to become coaches. But at the same time, they have developed as a team. I have never, though, Tom, to anticipate your next question, measured team psychological safety because I cannot. You cannot measure team psychological safety with a group of strangers, right? You cannot tell them the first day how it is personal risks. They don't know each other. So I don't have the possibility to do that. But now you give me a very good idea to actually measure team psychological safety in this team after they work together for five or six days in their in their action learning school to become coaches. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Peter. I can't see any other questions. So I'm going to wrap up this webinar. Thank you all for attending. And if anybody is interested in action learning more, go to whilepoland.org. You can find articles there and some information about the School of Action Learning and the certification. And also while.org, that's w-i-a-l.org. You can find even more materials there. So Peter, thank you so much for being here. That was a great presentation. It was really amazing to, to listen to what you shared. I thank you and I just send a message to all. Thank you to all for your questions and uh, contributions and I hope it was uh, useful. Thanks so much again. Thank you all and hopefully I will see you in the next webinar that's coming up in December. I will talk to er Dr. Eric Sabiegalski uh, of Polish origin, by the way, but he's from the United States and he did some research of ambidexterity in organizations. So he, he's going to tell us something about how to develop ambidexterous organization, whatever that means. But hope to see you in that webinar very soon. Uh, stay tuned. I'm going to send you some emails about it. 
and have a great evening, have a great afternoon wherever you are. Thanks very much and...